Well, I have the distinct pleasure this morning to welcome Alex Wendell to the pulpit. Woo! Alex is going to be bringing the word to us this morning, so buckle up because God wants to talk to us this morning. And um, can we just, can we give Alex one more hand in a second? Because he is an amazing teacher and he has a word to bring to us today. And can we just agree that we're going to receive what the Lord is going to say through him? Can you just give him a hand? All right, take us there, Alex. Thank you so much, Shayla. And thank you, Jake. Oh, God is so, God is so good. God is amazing. Just, I have a hard time sometimes playing drums back in there because I just, I just want to worship and lift up my sticks. And I'm like, ah, well, I, I should probably, I should probably play. <laughs> uh. Okay, so uh, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Alex Wendell. Uh, I and uh, me and my wife that you just saw, uh, we lead a uh, youth group on, thir- on Thursday nights. And, um, and so when I teach uh, them, usually I always ask a lot of questions, and that's most of the time. It's it's a dis- it's more of a discussion. So um, I'm going to start off with uh, some questions for you. All right, who likes payday? Raise your hand. That's usually a good one, right? <laughs> it's typically, we like payday. That's nice. That's good. And uh, who has ever thought about, if I win the lottery, what, what would I do with it? Has anyone thought that before? I'd say I think that most, most people have. Um, uh, another super easy question is, uh, uh, who loves telling people how much they made last year? <laughs> no one. I didn't see a single hand. <laughs> or better yet, uh, maybe how much you gave away to people or the church. No. So we have, oh, what, one more, one more just really great one. Who loves talking to their, their, their spouse about finances? It's, it's never a, hey, I found $2,000. We're going we're gonna to go to Disneyland or whatever. It's, it's never like that. It's, okay, we have to uh, strap down and think about this and take care of it. Um, so we have... Uh, we have some complicated feelings and ideas when it comes um, when it comes to money uh, in general. And for me, uh, for me, God has been pointing out uh, idols in my life around around money. And over the last couple months, and that's where I'm, I'm coming to talk to you about sort of through my process what God has been talking to me about and um, what He has to tell the church today. So uh, through these convictions, I, I brought this up to, to Pastor Rich. I was like, I just, I just feel like we really need, the whole church needs to, to hear a message about, uh, about giving. And Rich was like, all right, well, if you want to go for it. And it's like, well, that's not exactly, exactly what I meant. Um, <laughs> and so I was like, you know what? Okay, well, I, I can preach through some of my convictions that God has been talking to me about. And I have developed some very strong convictions from what the Holy Spirit has told me and backed up through scripture. And so when I went down to start writing this message, um, I was taken aback because I felt such the fear of the Lord around this topic. That this is not something to take lightly. This is not something to not be careful with my words about. And so through praying for, for more wonderful people to join our church and praying for what a building might look like one, one day, uh, hopefully soon, and for, for here and also all the kiddos, as, as many of you know, it's pretty packed back out there too. So I'm praying for these things. And, and that's, that, that's what led me to, to ask, ask for this. So um, through the fear of the Lord, I was also asked by him to get rid of my preconceptions about what, what I think, even what he's told me directly about what he says about money. Get rid of my preconceptions and just listen to him and look at his word and nothing else. So I'm going to ask you all to do that with me right now because I'm sure as I started talking about this, I'm sure some of you are like, oh, okay, it's going to be one of those Sundays. And that's what I don't want it to be. I want it to be us listening to our Father in Heaven speaking to us, the Holy Spirit speaking to us, and us reading the Word. 
and what he has to tell us today. So let's pray. Dear Father, you are so good. You are so good, and you have so much to say about, about finances, God. And so I just ask, I ask that every heart here, that every heart here, every heart online, that you just, you, you bring our guards down and open to what you have to say, backed by scripture and your Holy Spirit. Lord, ne- let nothing else come out of my mouth. Please make it stop if I were to say something that you don't agree with. And God, if that's not the case, please wipe it from anyone's memories who hears it. Because I just want to say what you have to say, God. Lord, I thank you. In your son's name we pray. Amen. All right. So one of the things, so God has been talking to me, again, for, for several months about, uh, about finances. And one of the things that he asked me to do was to go and read, uh, go read all the verses about, about finances in scripture. So one of the first things I found was that there are 2,350 Bible verses about finances, stewardship, um, but there are, in contrast, there are 500 verses about faith and prayer. Now, that is staggering next to each other, and I think that God tells us things when we have hard problems with it. So we might have problems with faith and prayer, um, but when it comes to finances, it seems like we have a much harder problem with it, just based off of that, or God has a lot more to say about it. And so uh, today, we're going to start a 108-week series on uh, finances throughout the Bible. <laughs> no, I have, I have one week to tell you <laughs> about uh, about it for now, but it's so important, right? Where there's over two thousand verses about it, and it, God talks about everything from from several different kinds of offerings to how to treat your employees, how to ask for for fair wages at your employer, how you will be blessed if you follow Him, and that your employers being faithful, or sorry, being believers, or unbelievers. And God talks about God talks about pretty much it all about investing. It's it's quite it's quite wild, but again today. We're not getting there. Uh, today, the first, the first stop on uh, our journey to understand what God wants us, God, what our heart should be towards giving is the first, uh, the first thing is, it's not mine. Uh, so it's not mine. Everything is God's, all of creation in God, uh, is God's, including finances. So let's take a look at just a couple uh, of, of verses. There's, there's dozens and dozens of them. Let's see. Okay, Psalm uh, 89, 11. The heavens belong to you, as does the earth. You made the world and all it contains. Deuteronomy 10, 14. The heavens, indeed, the highest heavens, belong to the Lord your God, as does the earth and everything in it. 1 Corinthians 10, 26. For the earth and its abundance are the Lord's. All right, well, I don't think that there's anything... Uh, ambiguous about that. Everything is God's. So if we want to think about giving, we have to understand that it's not even ours to begin with. It's God's. God gave us the opportunity to earn whatever number, big or large, is in our our, uh, checking account. That is the Lord's. And how God really struck this to me um, and God's been talking to me a lot more directly and harshly, as, as Jake has said a, c- a couple of times. He's talking to me a lot more like that, which I just absolutely uh, love and hate all at the same time. <laughs> so uh, at the beginning of this year, what kind of start, part of what in this journey was um, I, I had been working, working, for, um, working for a promotion, and God gave me, God gave me this promotion. It, uh, I was very thankful. Janae and I were very thankful. We thanked the Lord so many times. I thanked and respected my, my bosses who helped get me into this position. And uh, then I, I went to uh, update some like retirement numbers, right? In my human wisdom, I'm like, okay, I'm going to go and uh, start making sure that I'm retiring, I'm saving up for uh, in the future. And then once I changed that number, I realized the total amount 
was more now than I was, than I was giving on a regular basis. And so God mostly speaks to me in, uh, in like feelings for the most part. I get this kind of like thought that I'm not, that, that can't be me because that's contrary to what I would believe. And so this, uh, this thought was, are you really going to invest more in your future on this earth or the next? And then, and then I, I, I don't know exactly what this is like, but I imagine in the, the Old Testament where it says God like hardened Pharaoh's heart. I feel like he hardened my heart, made me respond immediately to him. And I was like, well, that would be a lot. <laughs> and then he said, so this wasn't a feeling. This was very direct. I know, I, I don't, no one was in the room with me when this happened, but they might have heard it too, was I can take it all away. I got shivers again. I've practiced this dozens of times, and I still get shivers every single time I think back about that. God can take it all away. Who, who was I to, like, think, think that maybe he couldn't? Like, I never said that out, out loud. Oh, God can't take my job away. No, absolutely not. But clearly, there was something that God was pointing out in me that wasn't coming through in my finances. Right? My reverence for God in the area of my finances, when even I thought I was doing a good job, I did not have the heart of God there. And I probably still don't, and God will continue to work on me. Let's take a look at uh, Luke 12, uh, verses 29 and 34. All right, so... Uh, so do not be overly concerned about what you will eat and what you will drink. Do not worry about such things. For all the nations of the world pursue these things, and your Father knows that you need them. I'm sorry, which, what verse does it end at? Is it 30 on the screen? 30, okay, okay, okay. Wait, so 31 is the next one? <laughs> Okay, thank you, sorry. Um, for all the nations of the world pursue these things, and your Father knows that you need them. Uh, instead, pursue his kingdom and take these. Pursue his kingdom, and these things will be given to you as well. Do not be afraid, little flock, for your father is well pleased to give you the kingdom. Sell your possessions and give to the poor. Provide yourselves purses that do not wear out, a treasure in heaven that never decreases, where no thief approaches and no moth destroys. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Ooh, well, when you put all the other scripture in front of that, in front of that f verse that a lot of us know, where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. also. He's, he's talking about giving your things away, selling your possessions, giving to the poor so that you can, so that he will give you the kingdom, right? The kingdom of God, bringing heaven down on earth is what we're called to do. So this is, this is where I, I was coming from out of these, these strong convictions. Like, oh, I know, I know what I'm going to talk about today. But the first thing to know is it's not mine to begin with. That, that number, whatever promotion, whatever job that I'm in, it's not mine. So we are holding on to things that God has provided for us. And what's the term for that? That's stewardship. 1 Corinthians 4 uh, Verse 2 says, Now what is sought in stewards is one uh, is that one be found faithful. So we're stewards of God's things, and he's asked us to be faithful with it. Well, how do we become faithful uh, with, with what he's given us? So the story in the Bible of Joseph, I think, is a fantastic representation of what God can give us and what we're supposed to be faithful with. So Joseph, one of 12 brothers, gets sold into slavery by his brothers to a man named Potiphar. When he's there, and for several years while he's there, he, he works and is faithful in his position as a slave where he gets entrusted with much and is running the things of Potiphar's house. And he's doing well and he's treated well. And then something else happens. Potiphar's wife has an eye for him. But he says, no, I am faithful to God, and through that, faithful to my master Potiphar. 
Well, he is then accused. He's accused, uh, falsely accused of rape, and then now is sent to jail. So now he's in jail for something he didn't do when he was, for what we can see in scripture, he did everything he was supposed to do. He was faithful, and yet he still was thrown in opportunity. opportunity that's a weird way to say thrown in jail for years falsely. Um, now he had the opportunity to be put in, in jail, and he could have, he could have not been faithful with his opportunities there, but what did he have the opportunity to? He had to interpret dreams for some people going back to the, uh, to the Pharaoh. And then he was recognized in that faithfulness. Not then immediately, it was years later, then he, he got brought into the court. And then he had another opportunity of being faithful for what he was given to serve the Pharaoh. And then now he gets put at the right hand of the Pharaoh and through his faithfulness, he then saves and essentially establishes the entire Israelite nation as we know it. We are benef benefactors of his faithfulness thousands of years ago. One man's faithfulness in the pits of a jail in all parts of his life. That, that blows my mind. That we, we get, the Bible would look entirely different if he wasn't faithful. And so in that story, I didn't mention a single time like what he did with his money. So you might be thinking that, well, well, how is that? Well, he was faithful with what God gave him in these opportunities. And I think that's important, that's important to know. Uh, that's important to know here. And let's, let's have a new, uh, a new Testament verse to, to go through this as well. Ephesians 6, uh, verses 5 through 8. Slaves, obey your human masters with fear and trembling, the sincerity of your heart as to Christ. Not like those who do their work only when someone is watching, as people pleasers, but as slaves of Christ, doing the will of God from the heart. Obey with enthusiasm, enthusiasm as though serving the Lord and not people, because you know that each person, whether slave or free, if he does something good, this will be rewarded by the Lord." Ooh, obey with, with enthusiasm. That is way easier said than done when you're asked to do things that might not make sense. You're asked to work uh, outside of your normal working hours to accomplish something that is not your fault. I don't know how many people have been there. <laughs> but that's not what he says. He doesn't say, oh, only if your job is easy or if your master is good. No. You're working as if unto the Lord. So being a faithful steward has to be with what, what our mindset is and how we act. It has nothing to do with who we are working for because we are uh, on this earth because we're all working for the Lord. So when we go into uh, our, our marketplaces or, it, I, or like our homes or whatever it is, we are serving as if we're serving God. And for those of who are working, God gives us through our job money as a side, as a side bonus. Yes. So if we have our, uh, the right mindset of everything I have is the Lord's, I'm going to be faithful stewards of what he has given me. Now, what do, we, what do we do with specifically giving out of that? Rather, what should our hearts be like? Each one of you should give just as he has decided in his heart, not reluctantly or under compulsion, because God loves a cheerful giver. God loves a cheerful giver. If you didn't know this, God doesn't need your money. It's all his anyway. He can, he can get it from somewhere else. But God doesn't need your money. So if he's asking us to give and over and over again in the Old Testament, we see Abraham, uh, the first mention of a tithe, 10% uh, of what he owns. He finds a priest, Melchizedek, and gives him 10% of all he owns. This happens uh, several times until then he gets, uh, sorry, then we get to uh, the law under Moses. And God gives a lot more specific examples on where to tithe and how to tithe and all these crazy things that no one has ever been able to possibly follow 100%. Except for Jesus, of course. <laughs> so 
So in the New Testament, we see not a, a, a refuting of, of tithing or these other kinds of offerings and giving to God, but we see, we see a shift of, well, God loves a cheerful giver. It's about our heart. And that doesn't mean that those things in the Old Testament, those principles of tithing and things were wrong, but God cares more about our heart. And part of that is being, it, it, is the giving being sacrificial, too. I'm sure that there are, uh, there are many people, there are many people that could give a, uh, give a full tithe and it not be sacrificial to them, right? David, uh, David says in 2 Samuel 24, 24, I will not offer burnt offerings to the Lord, my God, which cost me nothing. So I'm sure that there are, there are people, uh, that if they attended here and gave a tithe, we could probably uh, buy a whole block in Tucson with just their tithe, and it probably wouldn't matter to them at all. But that's not what God is saying here. We have a cheerful giver and a sacrificial heart with these kinds of things. We have another story of Jesus watching people give into the giving box during his ministry, and he says that there are many, there are many people, uh, many rich people who give uh, large sums, but a poor widow comes and gives two copper coins amounting to a cent. And Jesus said that she gave more. He cared so much about her heart. It wasn't, it wasn't the amount, but it happened to be all that she had to live on. But her heart was so pure and wanting the things of God. I, I'm reminded of, we... We had a member from the community come in. This must have been over over uh, over a year ago, and sit in on a couple services. And an offering was passed passed around, and he gave a, a, a twenty twenty dollar bill. And I forget I forget who, but someone saw saw it and went up to him, uh, and, and, and went, went to go help him out. And it turns out that was literally all that he had. That that was the only money he had, and he just gave it he just gave it all to God right there. Man, I wish that I had that heart. If that doesn't convict you about what we think about finances and how much faith we put in God over our finances, I'm not sure. I'm not sure what else can. Sorry, I'm trying to figure out <laughs> if I should go to this or not. We'll get there. We'll get there. Okay. Let's take a look. Let's take a look at Malachi chapter 3. You know what? I'm going to come down here and read this. Make sure we're on the same page. Sorry, cameras. <laughs> Since I, the Lord, do not go back on my promises, you sons of Jacob have not perished. From the days of your ancestors, you have ignored my commandments and have not kept them. Return to me, and I will return to you, the Lord who rules over all. I mean, I know, I don't know about you, but I'm definitely guilty of this. Ignored my commandments and not kept them. There's certainly things God has asked me to do that I haven't. But God says, return to me and I will return to you. But you say, how should we return? Verse 8, can a person rob God? You indeed are robbing me. But you say, how are we robbing you? In tithes and contributions. You are bound for judgment because you are robbing me. This whole nation is guilty. Now, thank God it doesn't stop there. Verse 10, bring the entire tithe into the storehouse, which I just think is kind of funny because the entire tithe, the tithe is, the tithe is 10%. So how could, how could there be an entire one? But clearly there was, there was tithing not done the right way. So bring the entire tithe into the storehouse so that there may be food in my temple. Test me in this manner, matter, says the Lord who rules over all to see if I will not open up for you the windows of heaven and pour out for you a blessing until there is no room for it all. Oh. 
about test me in this matter. He says, bring your full tithe and test me in this matter that he will not pour out the blessings of heaven. Man, this is, that's challenging. Now, thankfully, thankfully we're not under the strict letter of the law and have to obey all of the, all of the different ways and tithes and offerings that had to be done. But this still heart, still heart remains. In fact, during, during this, right afterwards, it mentions that they're going through a famine and that they're struggling to eat. And yet God says, give me your full offering, and offering your full tithe, and you'll see what I can do with it. I'll pour for you the windows of heaven and pour out for you a blessing until there is no room at all. And like many things in the kingdom, God's wisdom and direction doesn't always make a whole lot of human sense to us. If there's, if there's one thing that my walk the last couple years with God has been is that he asks us to do some weird things <laughs> that don't make sense. But he says, give them the full tithe even during a famine. I really believe that God is asking, asking us to test him in this, in this area of our lives. Are we gonna have faith or fear over our finances? Proverbs 3, verses 5 and 6. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, submit to him and he will make your paths straight. I like making sure that we add on that second part, that second part to this verse that a lot of us always know because yes, I'm gonna lean on God's understanding, but then I'm, then I'm gonna actually follow it despite my own, despite what I, what I might be thinking. And I know that probably right now, right now some of you are like, well, this is, this is, this is hard. Maybe, maybe I'm living paycheck to paycheck. Trust in the Lord. Lean not on your own, un, lean not on your own understanding. Maybe, maybe you're on the other side of it where you're like, well, I've, I've built my business, I've, I've done so much work, why can't I just enjoy it all? Trust in the Lord, lean not on your own understanding. Jesus said that it's easier for a camel to fit through the eye of a needle than a rich person to get into heaven. So what, what could God do? What could God do with a full tithe from us? What could God do? What could he do in Verge? Could we get to a building faster? Could we financially support our pastors so they didn't have to work maybe one day? What could he do in your house, in your, your hearts and attitudes, in the, the attitude and the, the conversations with your, your spouse around these topics? What can he do in your job? How could the Lord bless you through this? There are, there are many verses, there are many verses that talk about trusting in the Lord and the finances and blessing with material things. But there's also many verses where he's talking about being able to contribute and being a part of the things, the things of God. Right? that he will not withhold the kingdom from you. And what is that more important than a raise at work? Is more access to the kingdom of God, to be more in his presence every single day, to have more of the things that he's, he has provided, a promotion in the kingdom, if you would. I would much rather have that. Second Corinthians 9. Remember this. Whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. Whoever sows generously will also reap generously. Each of you should give what you have decided in your heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. And God is able to bless you abundantly 
so that in all things, at all times, having all that you need, you will abound in every good work. As it is written, they have freely scattered their gifts to the poor and their righteousness endures forever. So when I read this, this is not one of those verses promising material things. This says that when you give generously, you'll sow, you'll sow generously. But what is that? It's saying that you'll have all that you will need, but part of what you'll be sowing is that be recognized as, as people of God who give their gifts to the poor and live righteously. Matthew 9, uh, Jesus said, when he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them because they were bewildered and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. And then he said to his disciple, the disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. So what does that mean with our finances? When we're talking about sowing in sparingly versus generously. God doesn't need your money to do, do anything but it's an opportunity that you get to be a part of. There's part of working and sowing into things that we can now go and reach people. I will ask this, if, if this church has helped you connect to Jesus more and help you know more of the things of God, can you just raise your hand? It's like practically everyone. <laughs> that's, that's part of the reaping of this, is that there are people, there are souls impacted for the kingdom of God. That's what, that's what we get to be part of. Isn't that such a joy? That verse is still up, and this, this part's really, really important. Verse 7, each of you should give what you have decided in your heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. Right? God, if you were if you were to give your entire salary, but you had such a hard heart about it, God doesn't want that. He doesn't, he, doesn't, he doesn't care about that. He cares about your heart. So it's not, it's not about pressure. As you probably know, we're, 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 we're going up to, to take an offering. And it's not about something specific. It's not about, oh, I want to give because I want a, a new building or I want the colors of the walls to change or what, whatever it might be. It's about submitting to God. When Jesus tells the parable of the, of the builder who built his house on the firm foundation, it was two things. That they heard the word of God and then they obeyed it. And if I have done my job faithfully today, you can see that we, God asks us to give and give generously, but with a cheerful heart. And so whenever, whenever uh, Janae and I go to, go to give, it is funny how often Jesus, the Holy Spirit, will put in a very similar number. It's happened over and over again, or the exact same number several times, to give to a specific scenario, to give to something or other. So I'll challenge you. I'll challenge you to ask God, what does a full tithe look like for you? There's a full tithe for today, but. It's not, it's not about today, it's about what it changes the next payday, right? How does your, what, what is your heart saying? What is God, sorry, not what is your heart saying? The heart is deceitful. What is God telling you? <laughs> what is God telling you that you should give? Because there's stuff, there's stuff in the kingdom that he wants to give you. And you need to obey him in this way for you to be a part of it. It could, it could be material things. But that's not what we're, that's not the heart of, that's not a cheerful giver. A cheerful giver is to give it away. If God blesses you with more, what do you do? Give it away again. <laughs> if 
we go back to, to Malachi, said that they were, they were robbing, the Israelites were robbing God. Well, I'll tell you, through this process, I, I was robbing God. I didn't know it at the time until he revealed it to me, but I was, I was robbing God of a full tithe of what he was asking me to give. I thought, I thought it was enough, but then he changed my heart. I don't want to rob God of these things in feast or famine. Right? He was asking them out of, out of famine, give a full tithe. Because it is never ours even in the first place. We're just a good stewards of what God has called us, what God has given us. So what are we going to do with it? Andrew, can you come up? Thank you. Can we put 2 Corinthians back up there? I know we're making the slides. People do uh, hopscotch here. While that's coming up, I'm actually going to read another verse. And this is after Noah and his family got off the ark. And they gave an offering to God. That was the first thing they did when they got off the ark. And it says in verse 21 of Genesis 8, And the Lord was pleased with the aroma of sacrifice. And he said to himself, I will never again curse the ground because of the human race, even though everything they think or imagine is bent towards evil from childhood. I will never again destroy all living things. And I think we, we think the promise of God ends there, but there's a verse that follows after that. And it says, as long as the earth remains, there will be these things. There will be planting and harvest or seed time and harvest. There'll be cold and heat, summer and winter, day and night. Part of the promise of God and part of the way that this world is going to work and as long as it exists is that there will be seed time and there will be harvest. And God asks for that seed. He requires that seed for there to be a harvest. A lot of the parables that we see that Jesus talks about, he even says the kingdom of heaven is like a man sowing a seed. This is a principle that is a spiritual principle that we get to see and that we get to test and try out in the natural. And so I want to actually talk about a story where, where someone demonstrated this um, recently in, in our church. God promised them a house. They had faith for the house. They were claiming that promise. And a year went by and there was no house. And even more time went by and there was no house. And I asked God, I said, I know you've promised them this house and they have faith for it. And all the people in our church are praying for them and they have faith for it, but there's no house. Why is that God? He said, they're not giving me my seed. So I can't give them their harvest. They had the faith, but they didn't have the obedience equipped God to be able to give them the harvest. Now, that wasn't a, a super fun conversation going to them, but because I loved them and because I wanted to see God, I wanted to see that harvest for them, I talked to him and, and actually he was super receptive. And he said, you're right, that's what God wants. And he immediately went back to giving to God. And within months, they had their house and it's a beautiful house and they've hosted many, many things there. And it's, it's just so amazing to see the harvest of God come to light, but it requires that faith and it requires obedience. And today we have an opportunity to put those two things together again. And like it says in second Corinthians, whoever sows sparingly will speak will reap sparingly. Whoever sows generously will also reap generously. This is a principle that you can see this, this word of giving is, is a sowing into the kingdom. It's a sowing into God, into, into obedience. But there's a reaping that comes if you're willing to sow. Even, this isn't just a finance thing. We're talking about finances today, so that's the lens that we're looking at this through. But this is obedience in every area, guys. This is being obedient with your heart. That's why he wants it to be a cheerful giving because if your heart's not right, then this doesn't matter, right? So this, is, this isn't, we're not just talking about finances, but that's, that is what we're focusing on today because that's what God's addressing. 
So let's take a couple moments and just give you the opportunity to pray with your family and ask God, what does being obedient look like for me in this moment?